Good morning, everyone. My name is John Pierce Calvo, and today I will be the moderator for today's panel discussion. And here we have Ms. Javeline Kidding and Ms. Jermaine Relampago to be our panelists for the specified lessons two, five, and seven. Without further ado, let us start our panel discussion. As we all start, I'd like to um, say good day to each and every one. So for the lesson two, our topic is all about the leadership skills and styles. In the previous lesson, we have learned about leadership. We also research who we believe has future leadership potential. Remember that good leadership is crucial to an organization's success. Lesson on leadership skills and styles, you will learn every individual individual will learn how to become a leader as well as successful leadership skills and strategies you will also assess your leadership style and practice your talents in, in engaging exercises so let's start how do we become leaders questions to ourselves so there are specific several ways in order for us to become a leader there um first the qualified what what does it mean to be a qualified leader some individuals rise to positions of authority simply by earning the qualifications required for the job. On the, on the other hand, they may satisfy the requirements or conditions that others in positions of power, power place on leadership. For example, a teacher with the highest degree of educational qualifications. Secondly, merited. Some individuals rise to the position of leadership largely as a result of their long-term commitment, enthusiasm, and ability to contribute. These leaders have paid their dues as the saying goes. Examples for this is a teacher that was once a qualifier in the national competition during college days. And third, captured, campaigning for a leadership position, becoming political or otherwise manipulating oneself into leadership positions are some of the ways individuals rise to power. It is possible for leaders in this category to gain control of or grab control of their positions in many ways. Examples for this is the school principals. And the fourth one would be the identified. When a person's personal or professional traits are acknowledged as useful and irrefutable and are suited for the team's requirements at a given moment, they become a leader. For example, project manager of a business or military general. Fifth, defaulted. When other team members refuse or are unable to take the role of the leadership, the person in charge steps forward to fill the gap. For example, someone in a small discussion group needs to lead the discussion. So when it, com when it comes to being a leader, what matters the most is what you can do for the organization itself. So for the skills, there are demand demanded for leaders. So there are three broad types of leadership skills according to Pito et al. 2019. These are technical skill, human skill, and conceptual skill. For the technical skills, um, for example, sending emails or creating PowerPoint presentations are also example for this. Second, human skills. In other words, it is the capacity to get along with, well with others and form co cohesive groups. People skills or soft talents are another term for this. And lastly, the conceptual skill. Well, for me, in my own, own opinion, conceptual skill is the most very acquired skill among the three because it shapes the leader's capacity to um to enhance the, their creativity, their idea, and innovations. Modeling, frameworks, and broad linkages such as long-term planning are examples of this. So leaders of schools should be able to handle both ideas and people. Psychomotor abilities are also asked for them. Leadership styles according to Prito et al. 2019. The following are different leadership styles according to him. First one would be the autocratic leaders who decide alone. This occurs when a memorandum is issued on policy execution without the members' awareness. And second, consultative leaders consult organization members but make the choice. When the school alters the curriculum or raises tuition, it calls consultation meetings. Leaders decide despite discussions. And third, democratic leaders. These let the members make decisions. This occurred at faculty meetings when the group's consensus is definitive. And lastly, the license fair. CEOs dodge accountability and let employees work in independently. 
This leadership approach allows members to mature to the point where, where they will work for the organization even without their leaders. Chaos will ensue if members do as they wish, even against this common good. So, for the first one, the term autocratic, this refers to the leaders who make all of their own decisions. Oftentimes, members are unaware of how policies are drafted until a memorandum has already been published on their implementation. And the second one, the consultative leaders, this enables members of the organization to participate by conferring them back but make the choice themselves. This occurs when the school upholds public meetings to solicit input on proposed curriculum modification or tuition increases. Consultations, on the other hand, doesn't mean that choices are decided by leaders. Third, the democratic leaders give their constituents a voice in the process of making decisions. This occurred at faculty meetings, as what I have said, when the group's consensus is deemed the final decision. And, the la and lastly, leader leadership that is licensed fair. This does not take responsibility for the job by the members of the organization, allowing the members to mature to the point where they can work for their welfare of the organization even when their leaders are not there is a benefit of this le leadership style. However, anarchy will inevitably ensue if individuals labor only to serve their own interests at the expense of the group as a whole. So those different leadership styles, the autocratic, the consultative democratic leaders license fair are the different leadership styles according to Quito et al. So as we proceed to the next lesson, I, I just wanted to ask you a one question. So that question says that do leader, leaders really need to acquire the three skills to be considered as a great leader? If not, for the following question, if not, what skill is important to possess? So, can we answer this, Mr. Calvo? Okay, so that leaders really do leaders really need to acquire the three skills to be considered as a great leader? If not, what skill is important to possess? So, I strongly believe that that these three skills are needed to become a great leader. Why? Because first is the technical skills. A great a leader should know how to send emails or create PowerPoint presentations. That is also important to send reports or either just to receive emails from other from other members. Next is the human skill. It is a, a capacity to get along or to socialize others. So it is a soft talent on on it is a part of so it is a a skill which is you it is a skill that is related to your behaviors and how you handle your people. Next is the conceptual skills or it is a advan advanced advanced planning or such as a long-term planning which it is it has a broad it is a broad ideas or the idealistics of being a leader. So I believe that a leader should acquire those three skills to be considered as a great leaders. What are your point of views, Miss Germaine Relampago? So, for me, leaders should acquire the three to be considered influ influential leaders. So, they should have the technical skills to be effective, productive, and completely involved. They must be able to exhibit the empathy and the and empower their members. They must also be able to receive direction and those above them and cascade the community plan down by their ter terms and offer it. Next, leaders require human skills. Leaders with solid human skills recognize their, their position in the leader-members relationship and the importance of trust, coherence, justice, empathy, and goodwill to the organization's overall performance. Lastly, the conceptual leaders can think through their ideas and turn them into actionable solutions because of their capacity to think about future scenarios and how to address them. Many see leaders with conceptual talents as strategic leaders. So, so um, acquiring the three, the three skills is indeed important to a leader. Um, I highly support your answers and respect them, but for me, conceptual skills represent one of the three, three skills identified by Robert Katz as critical to leader success in an organization. Each skill 
is useful in different circumstances, conceptual skills tend to be the most relevant in upper level making decision or upper level thinking and broad strategic situation as opposed to lower level and line management. As a result, a conceptual skills are often viewed as critical success factors of leadership. Conceptual skills um, primarily revolve around generating ideas utilizing a combination of creative intuitions and a comprehensive understanding of a given context. Yet, above all, in my own opinion, the most important skills that a leader should possess is conceptual thinking, as what I have said, given by the fact that this result in new ideas, unique strategies, and differentiation. Conceptual skills are important in empowering leaders in all levels of an organization to observe the operation of an organization and frame them conceptually as an aspect of that organization's strategy, objectives, and policies. Conceptual thinking allow, allows for accurate and timely feedback and organizational adaptability. So um, that would be all for the lesson two. Let's proceed to the next lesson that will handled by Mr. Jerome Perosilio Calvo. Thank you. Next is the basic concepts of evolutionary leadership. So this, so this part is, we can see that this certain comprehensive explanation of command structure and more broadly hierarchy, hierarchy configuration in groups must include evolutionary perspective. According to the research of Van Vogt and Von Ruden on last 2022, that it was thought that these people were naturally gifted learners within the unique leadership qualities that empower them to lead people. So I believe that leaders were born and were not born, but they are made. So according to the state theories, that leaders are either born or made. So according to evolutionary leadership theory, when deciding who to follow, people use developed cognitive leader prototypes. These are known as the cognitive ancestral leader prototypes. So from their ancestors, passed down to every generation up to the, our present leaders. So also evolutionary leadership theory looks at command structure from an evolutionary standpoint According to evolutionary psychology, our thoughts, feelings, and actions are the results of intrinsic psychological mechanisms, and these mechanisms evolve because they allow people to handle a situation that is necessary to sustain life and reproduction. To furthermore, the findings of the study reveal that which both sexual preference and physical governance selection processes can influence opportunities but most professionals have limited effectiveness in challenging these deeply ingrained assumptions about leadership. So the evolutionary leadership theory has have a seven competencies that serves as the foundational framework for developing evolutionary leaders. The first one is the personal evolution. This is the characterize of a shifting of perspective and maturation. So a person itself is changing as a time goes by. So it is a changing view of oneself in the world and one's place in the society. So next is the second is the emotions and generative language. Overall, if a vernacular working memory system is present, emotions induced by vocabulary may affect verbal processes more directly or differently than feelings induced by many other non-linguistic means. So it is um, the same with uh, human skills, which is a process more directly or differently than feelings, which is more in human nature. And next is the systems thinking. Systems thinking seems to be a comprehensive approach to management that focuses on how a system's component elements interact and how system functions over time and in the context of significant processes. So this systems thinking, it is like same with the uh, human skills, it is the socialization of a leader. Next is the systemic sustainability, a developmental process. It is an entity, a inst an institutional or societal that includes an adaptive emerging system that needs the developmental maintenance. So as a leader, it is, it, they have an ability to cope on their society. It is a more strong and supportive environment if their environment is weak. So a leader shall stand as a strong, so they can be, they can be the, the leader who can be leaned on by its members. Next is the ontological design. 
The styling discipline concerned with creating a positive human experience, it accomplishes this by operating under a single underlying premise that they people are creating spaces, tools, and experiences. We are in fact designing the human being. So a leader should have a ontological designing wherein he, is, he or she is capable to design its members to become who they want to be and meet its developmental maintenance. So he or she can guide its people. So next is the adaptive work and collaboration. So adapt is a necessary organization capability for dealing with adaptive changes. The developed models shape and guide adaptive collaboration, which supplies encouragement and guidance. So adaptive work and collaboration, if it's a, a leader who is guiding its people from its exact ideas or its other projects or what the leader wants, it's on ideas or what it's planned. Next is the evolutionary visions, scenarios, and wisdom. This competency assists leaders in comprehending our human evolution as living system and humans. It also encourages us to grow in enlightenment in order to achieve the right decisions for our future. So the evolutionary visions, scenarios, and wisdom, our leaders should have possessed this to basically have a broad, or broad idea on how he or she handle a situation or how he or she will be planning ahead of time. So my question is, what will happen if the seven competencies that serves as the foundation for developing evolutionary leaders will not be completely acquired? If so, what will be the outcomes if a leader has the seven competencies? So let us begin to miss getting. So what will happen if the seven competencies that serves as the foundation of, the de of developing evolutionary leaders will not be completely acquired? So lacking, lacking of the competencies that serves as the foundation of develop developing evolutionary leaders has a big impact in becoming effective leader. Leadership abilities and action that contribute to better performance are known as a leadership competencies. So organization may better identify identify and train their next generation of leaders by employing a competency-based approach to leadership. When the leaders lack the ability to provide direction, co coaching, and motivation for steps, our organizational culture and moral often suffer. Poor leadership is the root cause of high, employee, high members turnover and loss of productivity. Without a direction, members are at loss. They don't know what the goals are of the community and they don't know why they are working with specific processes. They will accomplish only mechanicality, not with an intelligent direction towards a common goal. To the next question, which is the, if so, what will the outcomes if a leader have a seven competences? So for me, leadership competences are the talents and characteristics that make it, makes you a, an effective leader. Your team's trust and devotion in you will grow as a result of your expertise in or ability to demonst demonstrate these qualities. To increase the, the, the team's productivity, effective leaders inspire, motivate, and facilitate. A leader's worth is measured by the performance of their entire team, not by their personal accomplishments. Every sector relies on effective leadership, demonstrating that you are a capable leader in your profession might make you a valuable team member. If you want to become a leader in your workplace or if you want to improve your current leadership skills, consider evaluating your leadership competences. So, Ms. Kedi, what is your idea or what is your view or opinion about the said topic? And to my questions. Um, if the seven competencies that serve as the foundation for developing evolutionary leaders will not be completely acquired, namely personal evolution, emotions, and generative thinking, uh, uh, generative language, systems thinking, systematic sustainability, ontological designing, adaptive work, and collaboration. Lastly, evolutionary vision, scenarios, and wisdom. Um, I think the effect would be a late adaptation for new and inventive inventions would result. A late response to many life situations that demands them to face difficult challenges, nuisance, and adjustments for the evolutionary leaders. In response to the following question, 
the outcome shows that if a leader possesses seven, com seven competencies, all of them, they will continue to improve their skills in order to effectively collaborate and meet the, develop the development demands of the society of today's workers. Okay, thank you. So in my, in my own idea or in my own perspective, so is it necessary to possess the seven or acquire the seven competencies that serves as the foundational framework for developing evolutionary leaders? For me, it isn't necessary because why? It is because first is the important only is the personal evolution, the emotions and generative language, the systems thinking, and the systemic sustainability. So this four has is important because this only circulates around the as a great leader because a personal evolution it is a time to change or shift in perspective next is the emotions which is it is the way on how a leader link on its people next the systems thinking it is a comprehensive approach and focuses on the component elements on how a leader interact with its people lastly is the systemic sustainability it is a adaptive emergence system that meets the developmental maintenance on how he cope or he or she cope a leader as a leader to its people and and how he or she guides its people through it through his or her um plan so that would be all for my perspective thank you so we would tackle the next lesson to be given to us by miss um germaine relampago so now we are going to uh talk about the lesson seven, which is the instructional leadership. So defining the instructional leadership. So the Center for Educational Leadership has drafted the concepts of a framework of on instructional leadership based on five core beliefs. One of the most critical school related factors in relation to school leadership that administ administrators are struggling with instruction instructional leadership. Given that delicate task on of ensuring quality teaching and learning, instruction, instructional leadership needs to constantly look for best strategies and methodologies. So instructional leadership focuses on the five management of resources and people, recruiting, hiring, declaring, evaluating, particularly in the rapidly changing environment. It addresses the diverse culture, linguistics, socioeconomic and learning backgrounds of the school community. Instructions are guided in a culture of public and reflective practice. So the school, the school improvement plan. So the school improvement plan or the SIP is a roadmap that lays down specific interventions that a school with the help of the community and other stakeholders will undertake within three consecutive school years. So ISP seeks to provide those involved in school planning and evidence-based systematic approach with the learner's point of view as the starting point. Next is the Brigada Escuela or the Working Together for School. This usually happens before a school year start. So it is a nationwide initiative by the Department of Education or the DepEd. It aims to unite all stakeholders involved in prepare preparing schools for the start of the school year. So the people invo involved in, or the people who are helping in Gladys Escuela includes the parents, um, the teachers, the st school staff, and the alumni of the school. So to sum things up, teacher leadership is the capacity to empower oneself and others to effect social, social change in a just and sustainable world. Instructional leadership is the ability to ensure quality delivery of curriculum and instruction for students or optimum learning. Advising leadership is the process by which teacher, teachers influence members of the academic communities. Educational practices with the aim to provide student learning and achievement. So that's all for the uh, module seven or the instructional leadership. Now, um, I, am, I am going to ask question about this topic. So my question is, to instructional leadership really necessary if a leader has a lack of competences and skills, especially in a solid moral purpose? Again, so do instructional leadership really necessarily 
if a leader has a lack of competences and skills, especially in a solid moral purpose. So may I hear the answer of Mr. Calvo? When you say um, solid moral purpose, that promotes deep student learning, professional inquiry, trusting relationships, and seeking evidence in action, and outstanding leadership requires attention. So instructional leadership addresses the diverse cultural, linguistics, socioeconomic, and learning backgrounds of the school community. So if you say if a instructional leadership, ha if a leader doesn't acquire the competencies and the skills, so a leader don't have a, an instructional leadership. Why? Because as I told earlier, the instructional leadership addresses the diverse cultural. So which means a leader has a capacity or has to possess a social interaction with its people. So if a leader don't have or don't won't acquire this skill, the human skill, then he or she won't have the diverse cultural or the the interesting relationships to its people. Next is the skills are or the linguistics or the social economic and learning backgrounds of the school community. Wherein a leader won't won't be enough to become as a leader to guide its people, and because of that. Um, it's professional inquiry, the seeking evidence in action won't be, won't be solid, solid, so, or what we can say is this, um, a leader won't be not enough, a leader won't be not enough to act such a things just like a Brigada Escuela or a, such as a school improvement plan or what we can say is under be the Brigada Escuela. Next is uh, Ms. Javeline, what would be your answer? For your question, a school's vision and goals are developed and communicated by an instructional leader who sets high expectations for students' progress. Principals who are also instructional leaders influence student learning by motivating them to, con to consistently improve their teaching approach. However, instructors who demonstrate leadership abilities in the field have a higher influence. Teachers who learn to transform their successful classroom methods into a com common vision that can assist the school, the district, or even the industry move ahead benefit children well beyond their classroom. So, teachers' competence is critical for the well development of pupils and providing quality learning, particularly for students at vocational institutions, for the instructional leadership. Teachers' competence will benefit students' academic growth and abilities while also assisting teachers in improving their teaching ways. Most crucially, if a leader lacks the necessary competencies and abilities, he or she will be unable to lead an instructional leadership. This will have an impact not only to them, but on the entire community itself. So, thank you, Ms. Javeline. So, for me, leadership with moral purpose implies committing to make a difference in students' life and outcomes as a result of their educational experiences. The morals of a leader can have a variety of effects on their ability to lead. If leadership is a relational process of per of persuading followers to achieve common goals, then moral leadership suggests what those goals should be and how they should be accomplished. The morals of a leader can have a variety of effects on their ability to lead. If leadership is in the rational process of persuading followers to achieve common goals, then moral leadership suggests what those goals should be and how they should be accomplished. So that's all for the module seven. So that would be a exciting and more um, mind-blowing discussions all about the lessons two, lessons five, and lesson seven. So we have learned so much in this discussion, aren't we? Um, next is, um, I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful that that the our panelists have a different perspective on how this, on how the, the EDUC 3 module five on the specified lessons really tackled or what lessons really should about on it. So thank you for your time panelists and thank you for um thank you for the wonderful and a mind um or let us say um educational um educational um lessons.
for that we tackled. So that would be all. So thank you.